May 8th, 2020 uh, budget study session uh, to order. Or, or, uh, roll call, please. Floor. Here. Ms. Yelsey. Here. Ms. Yelsey. Here. Okay. Here. Thank you. Ms. Black. Here. Ms. Bartow. Ms. Bartow. She is on her way. Okay, thank you. Ms. Anderson, thank you. Ms. Snell. Here. Ms. Bar Ms. Matoye. Here. Dr. Navarro. Here. Thank you. Uh, great, by order of uh, Executive Order N2920 issued on March 18th, 2020, the Newport Mesa Unified School District Board meetings will be closed to the public. The public may watch the meeting by joining the Zoom webinar and we have provided that link. Um, there's also um, habrá uh, interpretación al español a través del mismo enlace de Zoom. Um, I just want to remind everybody that we're going to put everybody on mute. Uh, Sherry will have, will be, is Sherry, are you going to be, keep us on mute until, unless we're speaking? Jenneth has that. Okay, Jenneth is going to keep us on mute. Uh, another couple of simple reminders, if you have to leave uh, the meeting uh, for whatever reason, please put yourself on, uh, take off your video. Um, so we're, we're, we're cautious about, uh, about all of that. Uh, we don't want any embarrassing um, pictures going out. Um, and also, uh, let's see, is Ms. Bartow, um, there have been no public com um, no comments or questions from the board members. There have been some comments um, and some suggestions. Um, I am going to make the suggestion that if you have suggestions about practices or ideas, please cite where you're getting the information because we are very limited on the number of individuals that can do research. Um, as you know, all of us are working from home. And so, and they're working on lots of other priorities than to try and do the research. So if you have suggestions, I appreciate Ms. Bartos, um, not Ms. Uh, Anderson, she's always, when she sends her suggestions out, she always puts in um, the information so that we can, re we, we can refer to it. And I really appreciate that, Ashley. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm. uh, but again, we're just, we're trying, um, this is mm -hmm. our third meeting. So we're gonna be trying to, um, we, we keep getting better at this. Um, I will let you know that um, we are dispensing with, basically at this point in time, uh, the three minute, we're gonna read all the public comments that are sent, at, that are sent in. Um, it still has a 400 word um, limit, but if it goes a little longer, we're going to be okay with that. Uh, but we just don't want 65 pages, to be real honest. Um, we can't afford that. Um, but again, if you, if, you are, if you have suggestions, and we love suggestions, I know uh, Fred and uh, Sherry love suggestions. It's just that we just don't have the the capabilities and the time to do the research. So just give us, um, if it's a district that's doing something different, uh, send it over to Fred and, um, and Russell or whoever and, and Sherry so that we can, um, she can follow up immediately with that specific district um, or suggestion. Um, I'm, I'm still, I'm waiting for, sh I'm waiting for Ms. Bartow, but I don't think we better wait too much longer. So. Uh, so Dr. Navarro, would you like to um, take over and we have, uh, let's see, um, adoption of the agenda. May I have a motion to adopt the agenda? So moved. Matoye moved. And a second. Adoption of the agenda. A second? Second. Thank you. Uh, uh, Ms. Matoye, uh, Moved and Mrs. Black seconded. Uh, roll call, please. Ms. Fleur. Here. Ms. Yelsey. I mean, yes. Ms. Yeah. Yelsey. Yes. Yeah. Ms. Black. Yes. Ms. Bartow. Ms. Mm -hmm. Anderson. Here. Yes. <laughs> Ms. Snell. Yes. And Ms. Matoy. Yes. 
This is for Ms. Bartow's been locked out. She's been trying to get in for the last couple minutes. Okay. Can uh, Jenna, can you let her in? She's using some name I don't know. I do not see her anywhere. I don't know that she's locked out of our meeting. She's locked out of the room that her stuff is in, from what I understand. So, oh, <laughs> she she will text us all. I'm sure if she's not in, we'll we'll let you know as soon as possible. Is she, that I'm is she in the waiting room? Is there a waiting room? She is not in in the waiting room. Oh, she's locked out of her office. Well, yes, but okay. So she she has her computer in her office. <laughs> so that's probably what. So um, uh, can she hear us at all? Can we text her and have, have her use her phone? Sure. Yeah. Let's let's um have her use her phone until she gets on, and then um, so Miss uh so we uh we're going to community input on special agenda items only mrs black would you read the the statement please sure um this is an opportunity for the public to address the board <clears throat> on special meeting agenda items only each speaker has three minutes or more to address the board and speakers may not cede unused minutes to other speakers with board consent, the president may increase or decrease the time allowed for public comments, depending on the topic and the number of persons wishing to be heard. When addressing the board, it is helpful if you state your name and address for the record. Terrific. Um, we do have uh, three comments. Uh, so Mrs. Uh, Yelsey, would you read the first comment, please? Um, this is from Britt Dowdy. Great, thank you. Did you want me to read that? It says Anderson. I think it was Anderson. Oh yeah, I'm sorry. I, I'm sorry. I realize that she just she put them down. Yes, go ahead, Miss Anderson. I apologize. Okay. Um, this is from Britt Dowdy. Um, Dr. Britt Dowdy, President of Newport Mesa Federation of Teachers. The district budget is one of the most complex items considered by the school board. I'm glad time is being taken to explain the broad outlines of how it is developed. A significant philosophy I asked the board to consider is this. The largest and most important expense of the district are employees. Without the employees, we would not be serving children. All of the economic indicators for California point to an incredibly uncertain and potentially fiscally hard time for Newport Mesa next year. I asked the board to deeply think about its priorities and look at supporting the most important expense, employees that serve kids. This included a lot of, this includes a lot of certificated staff and classified staff. There are a lot of certificated staff um, working with kids this spring, social workers, special education specialists, counselors, and intervention teachers. We also see the classified support provided by food service, IT, special ed, instructional aids, translation support, and much more. Please reevaluate the various construction projects, service contracts, trainings and trips, and other soft costs to make sure that we have the employees in place to support kids next August. We, need, we know our students are going to need more emotional and academic support next fall than ever before. We don't know what will happen with regards to the presence of COVID-19 in our community and how that will affect instruction. This is a time to make sure that we have the right people in place to support kids and be mindful of costs that could be postponed or canceled. Terrific. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Dowdy. Uh, Wendy Lease, and I believe uh, Jen, uh, Michelle saying that she's getting into her room now. She's there yet? No, I don't see her. So, Miss Black, would you read uh, the second the second comment from Wendy Lease, please? I'm Michelle's in. I'm open. <laughs> I was just on mute. Sorry. Oh, sorry. There oh, you okay, are. Okay, go ahead. Okay, Michelle, would you like, can you read the, the second comment from Mrs. Lease? Absolutely, thank you. In 1992, an employee embezzled the district. 
This is from Wendy Lees. Two years later, the county went bankrupt. At some point, the trustees established a citizens finance committee to advise trustees. It is time to bring back the finance committee and appoint financially savvy local citizens to a new finance committee to help trustees spend millions of tax dollars to educate our children. Make it a priority in 2021. I am the vice chair of the city's FIPAC finance and pension committee. And I can tell you the city council now more than ever appreciates the wisdom from this committee appointed by the city council. Also one of the recommendations VPAC made to the city council, which the council ultimately approved was to establish a 115 trust solely for pensions, only pensions locked in wise decision. On April 17th, I filed a public records request asking for information on the district's policy, which allows funds to be moved out of Fund 17, the history behind the risk management stabilization account, and under what circumstances these tax dollars are moved out of Fund 17. The board voted, it voted in the 90s for the endowment from the Irvine Company to be used for educational enhancements. As a board member, I remember voting for the definition of enhancement. As of today, I have not been told when my public records request will be fulfilled. COVID-19 cannot be a permanent excuse. Budget discussions this year must be transparent and understanding the use of Fund 17 is important to this taxpayer and former board member. My public re records request is reasonable. It is incumbent on the district to be transparent in all its affairs. Finally, please allow citizens to make real-time comments during meetings using Zoom. Both Newport Beach and Costa Mesa City Councils have done it. It is time for the public to be able to engage and comment in school district meetings. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Wendy. And uh, uh, Ms. Black, you have uh, Marty O'Mara. Um, yes, from Marty O'Mara. Why is this meeting not an open session on Zoom? Budget discussion should be open to the public. And I believe, um, thank you. And I believe uh, Ms. Snyder responded to her and provided her again, again the additional leak, link. Uh, this is a, um, an open session. Um, our study sessions are always open. Um, again, the difference is right now is that we are in Zoom and we are in a webinar and we have panelists and um, those, that allows those individuals uh, to speak. Um, so we'll move on to the item that we're all here to talk about, which is the budget item six study session budget background. Um, I want to remind everybody that this is the background and that on May, on May uh, 29th, we will have a second uh, study session, which will be more um, in line with actual budget. Uh, as I want to remind everybody, next week is the May revise, and so it would be nice if we gave uh, Mr. Trader um, some time to, to, to digest and for all of us to digest um, the draconian and devastating um, May revise that's coming out, and so that he will be able to prevent, provide us with more accurate information on May 29th regarding uh, the actual budget that we may be looking at adopting. So uh, moving on, Dr. Navarro. Thank you, Mrs. Flora. First of all, it's nice to see all the board members. Uh, even though we're in separate places, it's still nice to see everybody. And I thank you for spending time with us again. Um, you know, in January, I would have thought that this session would be going uh, very differently with our set of assumptions. Unfortunately, we don't know what those assumptions are right now, to be frank. I think uh, Dr. Dowdy was uh, right in saying that these are unusual times and there are some issues that are evolving of which, is, which are out of our control. So today, uh, you know, rather than go over the typical assumptions of what we've had in the past, what we spent in the past, what we've received, what we received in revenue in the past, I think it's uh, best for us to understand as best as possible uh, where we've been and where where we are right now. So I'm going to ask uh, Mr. Holcomb to introduce uh, Mr. Trader, who will uh, who has uh, put together some information for us. So Mr. Holcomb, thank you, Dr. Navarro. Um, I really isn't much for me to do other than to ask Mr. Trader to uh, come online with us as well and to bring his 
presentation and start to walk us through uh, the work that he's been doing and preparing us uh, for this discussion. Mr. Trader. Good morning, it's good to be with you this morning. Um, can you all see my screen? Yes. All right, thank yes. you. Yes. All right, uh, so today we're just gonna cover three topics. Um, each topic, uh, if the board president would like, we can stop after each topic and have a recap discussion and get the board perspective if you like. Um, we will start off discussing the district's response to the Great Recession. This will help answer the question of how the board has handled economic crises in the past. You know, in many ways, the board established a template for handling economic crises during the Great Recession. And um, secondly, um, we will look at um, <clears throat> the current lay of the land, what we're going to perhaps be dealing with. And then uh, we will look at next steps. So let's take a look at the uh, Great Recession. You know, in many ways, um, the district adjusted, and those ways are still with us today. So let's get into the Wayback Machine, and let's dial that back to 2009. And here's a slide that was presented. This slide, uh, board members Fleur, Black, and Yelsey will remember. It's the same exact slide that was presented on February 9th, 2009. It was a budget planning session, much like uh, this one today. And at the time, the economy was cratering, and the state was in deep trouble projecting a deficit of $41.8 billion. Today, the state is projecting a $54.3 billion deficit, $13.4 billion in the current year and $40.9 billion in the budget year. It's a few billion different, um, but what's a few billion between friends, right? Essentially, we find ourselves in the same dire situation as we did in 2009. So in the impact to that of the Great Recession was that the education side of the budget was disproportionately impacted over the course of the recession, as shown here in what is the school services alligator chart. Uh, schools lost on average $1,503 per ADA. For our district, for NMUSD, that was about 30 million in total over the span of the entire um, uh, recession. And current estimates are for this COVID-19 recession, $2,800 per ADA. So um, the state uh, did a few things for us to try to help us during the Great Recession. And one of those was that they allowed to, we had, at the time we participated in about 10 big categorical programs and they allowed some flexibility to transfer amongst those programs. And it was very helpful, we utilized that. However, these programs are no more. They're not there anymore. And as such, the state is in no position to really offer any kind of flexibility in this regard. Secondly, the state allowed us to sweep ending balances from certain categorical programs. And again, this was very helpful and the district utilized that option. Um, that option may not be available to us with AB 1835 going forward. Now, <clears throat> it's important to look at what the state did to us because many of the tools that they used during the Great Recession may come back uh, for use again, because each one of them detrimentally impacted the district. So to start off with, the state simply didn't fund COLA. Uh, principal apportionment payments were slowed down, cash apportionments were deferred, and this, was, this costed us $10 million at the height of the Great Recession. And this proved to be a well-used tool uh, that the state used. And I expect that they will use the same tool again. It's akin to Wimpy's method of finance. I'd gladly pay you Tuesday for a hamburger today. Revenue limit funding was reduced. The state extracted millions of dollars from the district by utilizing the mecha mechanism known as fair share. <clears throat> Categorical funding was cut by 20%. Mandated reimbursements were deferred and were arbitrarily audited literally to death. NMUSD is still owed $20 million in mandated claims from the, the state associated with this period. And sadly, to this day, we are involved in litigation over this issue. 
And so it was a desperate time for the state, and we can see that the state utilized desperate measures to cope with the economic consequences. Here's again another slide that was presented on February 9, 2009. And um, as a result, the state had to balance their books, and, and that uh, balancing was on our side. <laughs> and we had to, to cut $8 million out of our budget. We had no choice but to cut. And in terms of magnitude, we are confident that the situation is worse than 2009. Our current situation is worse than 2009. And the hope is that the state has a rainy day fund, which is good. And the state's more attuned to the value schools have to the economy in helping the economy get going again. And um, there's possible federal help in the future. So we hope for those things. Hopefully those will be um, on our side. But we need to remember though, there's a double whammy out there because not only do we have to deal with the state and what they're doing, but we also have to look at our property tax funding stream because it's the largest funding stream that we have. And at the time of the, at the height of the Great Recession, our year over year property tax growth was less than 1%. So that's something that we're monitoring, looking at very carefully. So with that then, uh, that's the Great Recession. Um, do we want to stop here and talk or do would you like me to move on, President Fleur? I'm, I'm mute. Uh, any questions? Um, I'll, let me put on my screen to see whether I've got any uh, hands up. Um, Ms. Matoyer, you have your hand up. I do. Um, yesterday, Mrs. Floor and I participated in a discussion with Senator Morlock, who is very well versed in budget and finance, going through the bankruptcy of Orange County. Um, and just in general, that's his area of expertise. He did mention that we do have a Prop 98 rainy day fund for education, but that it just started getting funded. It's, it's, I believe Mrs. Floor, correct me if I'm wrong, it was 500 million. It had nothing to do with the letter B in it. And the deficit is so huge that he anticipated it would be gone in a blink of an eye. And, it would help the LCAP people, not necessarily us. So while there is a rainy day fund out there, it may or may not impact us. And that's something we need to remember. And one of the things I was hoping from this discussion, and it may be coming later, so I'm good. I'm okay with delayed gratification. Um, I, I would love to hear us talk about what the board had to do, what the district did, what cuts meant. What does that mean to us? Because I don't know that anybody on the board is so irresponsible that we think we can just go la di da di da and do things as they have always have been. And somewhere I'd also like us to explain that different money comes from different pots and we can't necessarily free it up. So thank you. Thank you. Uh, Ms. Anderson. Yes, I echo um, everything that uh, Mrs. Matoya said. And I also would love to know a little bit um, about what was cut directly after the embezzlement happened, because I think that is also a time within the last 20 years that there were significant cuts that we had to do. So I, was, I wanted to hear also what needed to be cut in specific form then as well. Great. Thank you. Any others? Um, also, Jeff, uh, during the Great Depression, uh, the Great Recession, uh, districts surrounding us went did furlough days. Is that correct? And there were a lot of layoffs. Is that not correct? That is correct. Um, we did not do furloughs. Uh, we did not do that or a pay cut. No. So we we um, we kept our employees whole. I mean, we didn't. We we we. We had the flexibility and the ability to, um, we worked on our, our, our categorical funded teachers, but the, 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 the bulk of our employees uh, were not furloughed or we didn't do layoffs. Is that correct? Uh, we did do some uh, layoffs, but that was mostly uh, positions, vacancies that we did not fill. So yeah, no furloughs. We did some layoffs, but it was mostly attrition related. Okay, great. Thank you. And then 
also too for the county bankruptcy. So we've had in the past 25 years, the Orange County bankruptcy, the embezzlement, and then the recession. So what did Newport Mesa do during those times? I think there's a lot to learn from that, which is partly why I'm glad we're having this meeting. So we can come in prepared and we don't necessarily have to recreate the wheel on some things. Great. Uh, Jeff, do you think you could get that um, that historical um, for us for the, um, and send it out to us? Yes, and, and the, the, um, the, at the time the bankruptcy happened and the time of the embezzlement, uh, the district was bouncing in and out of revenue limit and it was a, a very different kind of um, situation and there were more draconian kinds of things that occurred during that time. Yeah, okay. thank you. Okay, moving on. Uh, okay, uh, Jeff, go ahead. Okay, so let me share my screen again here. All right, let's talk about the lay of the land. You know, when one usually assesses the lay of the land in preparation for action, and given what we are facing, we are going to have to take some action. Um, there's no way around that. So how bad is it going to be? You might know this guy here, this is Bob Blattner. Bob Blattner is a consultant in Sacramento. He's very well connected, understands what's happening there. And EdSource recently interviewed him and they asked him, they said, hey, Bob, how bad is it gonna be? Bob's response was, it's going to be really bad. It's already really bad. And this was before the state just yesterday uh, dropped the bomb of a $54 billion deficit. So um, it's going to be uh, really, really bad. And why is he saying that? He's saying that because there's disturbing things that are happening to our economy. This is a chart from the New York Times. It's showing the um, gross domestic product, which is the sum of kind of everything that the nation produces. And it's showing the change. So if you look at the left hand vertical point there, you see percentages and it's showing uh, the percentage change in gross domestic product. And you see on the left hand side here, the great recession here and what happened in the Great Recession to gross domestic product. And then you go over to the right and you compare to what's happening currently. And this is just, uh, this is the thing that's important here. It's just our first quarter. We're already registering a, four, a negative 4.8% uh, decline in uh, gross domestic product uh, or production. And so, um, uh, as you can see, we're, this is moving very fast. What took us, you know, about a year to accomplish, we've already accomplished here in the first quarter, moving very quickly. And when you compare that, so again, let's take gross domestic product and compare that to the last four recessions. So on the left-hand side here, on the vertical column, you can see the change in gross domestic product, 5%. And on the, the horizontal piece here, where you can see the zero, three, six, nine, that's the months into the recession. And these lines here represent the last four recessions. And so you look at the black line, this black line is the great recession. And then you look at the red dotted line, that's the current estimate for the COVID-19 recession. And you can see here that it's already two to three times deeper in comparison to, to the Great Recession. And it's moving, we're only a month or so into um, the COVID-19 recession and look where we're going. We're, um, we're looking at uh, some substantial um, uh, declines. And that's showing up in unemployment. Unemployment has gone off like a bomb. You can see here on this chart here, this is the March uh, uh, unemployment claims. And you can compare over here to the left, the record high, the, this is the record high prior to COVID-19. So in weekly claims. So unemployment has just gone off like a bomb. And you can see that here on this chart here in terms of cumulative jobless claims. This is a cumulative uh, chart. And you see on the left-hand side here, these are claims in the millions. And you can see on, the le on this horizontal line, this is days into the recession and this blue and orange line, those are the previous recessions. We had the housing recession and the tech recession. 
And you see this black line is the COVID-19 line. And so what this is telling us is it took us one month in COVID-19 to do what it took in, uh, in terms of job claims, jobless claims, what it took over a year to accomplish in the past two recessions. So this is a very fast moving recession and it's deep and um, uh, anyways, this is, this is very fast. So, you know, when will it end? Uh, we don't know. Hopefully we will be able to get a haircut soon and we don't end up like um, uh, Cousin It from the Adams family. And so let's take a look at economic scenarios and what they look like because this might give the board a, um, some context for um, what kind of what we're in for. And so economic, there can be a, an economic recovery can look like a V. And that's usually when we have a sharp decline, a very brief trough, and then a sharp incline. This is probably not going to happen given the restraints that are being placed on businesses. You know, there's only going to be half the number of tables and restaurants, and people may not be um, uh, so inclined to participate in the economy just yet. So probably not looking at a V. Maybe it could be look like a U. That's where you have a sharp decline prolonged trough and then a sharp incline. Maybe this is possible, perhaps. We could have an L. We don't want it to be an L because an L is a depression. And that's where you have a sharp decline and then you just don't go back to uh, where you were at. Where you were at. Um, that's, we don't want that. We don't want an L. And then it could be a bounce in and out of recession, a W, where you, you're bouncing in and out of it. Most people are kind of settling on a swoosh, something like a swoosh. Um, Either way, though, it's going to be quite a ride. It's going to take us a little bit of time to dig out of this. Um, and we're talking, you know, a year or two uh, that we're having to uh, take a look and, and deal with this kind of thing. So um, let's uh, take a pause here. Um, so what does this mean to Newport Mesa? If you have small children in the room, you need to, may need to cover their eyes. You may need to cover your own eyes because this can contain scenes of disturbing graphic unacceptable misbehaving numbers. So this is what we're could this is what this could mean to Newport Mesa. So let's take a look at what the state may do and we've discussed some tools that they used during the Great Recession. They may be introducing a new tool called negative cola. And you'll remember Mike Fine, he's a former NMUSD CBO. He's now with FICMAT. FICMAT is the agency that assists districts in financial distress. They're, they're a leading expert on school finance. And FICMAT recently released guidance that they expect the best case scenario for us is a 2% negative COLA. And worst case is a negative 10%. So you may say, now, <laughs> we're basic aid. Why would we care? We don't get COLA. Doesn't, you know, that is going to impact us. But... <clears throat> Just as the state did in the Great Recession, they may implement what is known as fair share. And it's a method to make us share the same financial pain as our fellow LCFF districts. And um, so and you may be asking, what would that mean to us? So let's take a look here. If we had a zero cola over here on the right-hand side, that would be wonderful. We'd be doing high fives. It would be just absolutely terrific to have a zero cola. However, it goes negative, if they do a 1% negative, it's 2 million, 1.5, 3 million, 2, 4 million, 3%, 6 million, 4, 8 million dollars. I didn't have the heart to go any further. I couldn't, just couldn't do it. So you can see this is significant and they can easily get to that money through our pr principal apportionment. We currently get about 8 million dollars in principal apportionment. They could do that very easily. So, um, At the height of, in, in, in fact, at the height of the Great Recession, the state was taking $8 million a year from the district. And as a percent of budget, that was a 3.32% hit. So then um, we also, um, you know, are, are also concerned about our property tax projections. We're monitoring those, and we'll see what happens with that. The next secure payment is due on May 21st, and so we'll have that in time for your May 29th study session, and so we should be able to provide some more information on that. But let's talk about cash flow and the impact that deferrals may have on the district. 
Now, cash is terribly important because when you run out, you are done. It, it's just done. It's over. And so during the Great Recession and before that, the district had to borrow money to keep the general fund solvent over the cash drive period of July through December. We have this cash drive period that we have to deal with. And borrowing money is expensive and it's effort intensive. It requires attorneys and financial advisors, brokers, and on and on and on. Now, the treasurer has been a little bit more open to lending us borrow money, but, I, but still, that's going to be costly and it will be time intensive, effort intensive. And so if you think of cash flow needs as kind of like the, the, the gas gauge in your car, um, and there's not many more disturbing feelings of, uh, of running out of gas um, when you're in the middle of nowhere, you don't want to do that. Maybe perhaps some of you have been there before. I don't know. But the district has about $43.7 million available to keep the general fund solvent. And at that level, we have a full tank. But as we know, the board drives a full-size SUV, and it has air conditioning, lots of newly installed air conditioning, and you're cruising with the pedal to the metal because you want to get your students to where they need to go quickly, and you have all the Chromebooks plugged in. So our gas mileage is compared to a Ferrari. We don't very good, get very good gas mileage. Sorry, here. There you go. Uh, we don't get very good gas mileage. So um, and we need $25 million just under normal conditions to keep the, the general fund solvent during this cash drive period. Then when you factor in the deferral, now we're looking at, um, it's getting a little more dicey, the uh, pump light is now turned on, and then we factor in a best case scenario, which is the least of the worst cases, um, from FitMap, a negative $4 million. <clears throat> now we're now the red E is a split. So I'm expecting there's gonna be some cash flow issues. We're gonna have to sharpen our pencil. We're gonna have to figure out how to deal with that into next year so we can keep things afloat. So that is the lay of the land. Do we want to have any discussion on the lay of the land, or would you like me to continue? I'm muting myself. Okay, Ms. Anderson. Um, what are some of the past and best ways that we have dealt with the cash flow issue after July in the past? Um, circumstances when we had to cut back because I know we're but we borrow from the county right in the past we have issued uh, tax revenue anticipation notes we have not borrowed from the county because the county really didn't offer that option at that time okay so what are our other options the other option currently is to go to the county treasurer and borrow from the county treasurer Or, and, and the other option too, of course, is to sharpen our pencil and, and which we always do, but to, to manage cash very carefully. Or a combination of both. Correct. Okay. Um, Jeff, the county, we, 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 we are required to put all our funds into the county, but there's that long term, there's that long term, um, fund will that be made of you think that's going to be made available for um withdrawal or ne for needs the um the, the county has been um uh, very um helpful in this regard and they will uh, make available whatever cash we need it'll come at a cost of course um uh, and some effort Okay. Any possibility that we might flow into um, revenue limit? I don't expect that. We're about $100 million into revenue limit. Okay. We're about $100 million into it now. So we would, there would have to be a, a tremendous uh, reversal for us to have okay. that happen. Okay. All right. any, other, any other questions? Okay. Moving on. Uh, go ahead, Jeff. Continue, please. Martha. Martha, you've got a couple others. I see Char. Char, oh, yeah, thank you. I have to. I have to think about raising my hand and mechanically Michelle. and talk. Um, when you talked about principal apportionment, that we get eight million dollars of principal apportionment, is that formally known as categorical money, or if it isn't, what is that? Because our 
income is from our property taxes. So I wasn't quite clear on that one. That's a great question. Um, principal apportionment, that's actually a guarantee from the state, which is supposed to be in perpetuity. And it is about $8 million and we get eight, and that was a, due to an agreement um, a few years ago that the state made um, when we had the um, uh, tax increase, the state made a, a, an agreement with all this basic aid saying, we'll give you a guarantee of kind of what you lost of in the Great Recession of $8 million a year. So that's what we're it's getting. Like but it's like our unique. basic aid. It's our basic aid. That's exactly okay. what it is. It's our basic aid of one whatever it is. Constitution. Got it. Thank you, Jeff. Okay, Michelle, I'm sorry. I didn't see you. Um, my question is regarding the some of the revenue, and I was reading through uh, Bob's uh, insights. Now, some part of our property is somewhat from oil revenues as well, petroleum revenues, and that gets reassessed every year. Are we going to be discussing how that's going to affect our property taxes as well, considering how low it is? Well, um, there, we're monitoring that very carefully. Um, the auditor controller makes those estimates, and um, there is some concern there that that could um, cause um, some declines in our uh, property tax growth. So we are a little bit concerned about it. Okay, any other questions? Let me scroll down here. I don't see any. Okay, moving on. Great, thank you. Okay, I will share my screen here. Okay, so, um, so here we go. So let's um, take a look here at conclusion and next steps. Um, this we know, um, COVID-19 was really a black swan event. Hopefully we don't have one uh, in the near future and we can get over it. The upcoming period is gonna be really difficult. Um, the, uh, the bad news is really just getting started. And uh, the 2021 budget will balance, um, but it's going to require some significant adjustments. Now, again, we find ourselves in 2009 with no other choice but to solve this through substantial policy changes. And this is where, you know, uh, you've been so supportive in the past when we've had to deal with these things. And although, you know, we're going to be picking up every penny we can, um, a strategy of picking up pennies by itself isn't going to get us to where we need to go. This is, we're going to have to be very strategic and thoughtful. And in the past, um, the board has always yielded to continuity for students. And so um, we'll take your cue in the leadership that you provided us in the past in, in making this um, happen. And so the next steps we're looking at, we're going to assess the governor's May revised budget. That will provide us some information on how the state is going to deal with us. We will assess our 1920 estimated actuals, and we'll know pretty much where we're going to end the year at. Um, we're going to take a look at our multi-year assumptions and projections. And then we're going to have a discussion with you of recommended solutions and scenarios. And so uh, with that then, I thank you so much for your time and look forward to bringing you updated information on May 29th. Martha, you're on uh, mute. I'm sorry. Dr. Navarro, I'm going to turn it back over to you um, and and cabinet members so um, we can get your perspective and then I'll turn it over to board members because they have a couple of questions. I see you, Ash, I see you Ashley, and I see you, and Charlene. I do see you. Well, I, I do want to thank the board uh, for uh, the issues and the questions you've been brought up, that have been brought up. Uh, we've also been uh, reviewing those scenarios from the past. And I think uh, context and structure is really, really important when you look at the previous two large impacts uh, on the district regarding the fiscal health of, of, of the state. Um, the the, the uh, embezzlement and the, and the uh, bankruptcy of the county pretty much were a pretty quick hit. All of a sudden, there was this huge loss, especially with the county bankruptcy. 
Uh, and that kind of meant, it is similar to what we're ex experiencing now with the COVID-19 recession. The depth of the cut that we're facing is a lot more like the Great Recession. So the Great Recession took longer, but the depth of it is pretty similar. I, I really thought that once we got out of, out of 2012, that I'd never have to come back and face these level of, of reductions, but uh, I'm kind of having a little PTSD from my days in Anaheim and Lenox hearing Jeff present all this information because this is, this is significant. But I think context and structure are really, really gonna be important for us to define and come back to the board with what we define as content and structure with these cuts. Because in looking at what you did in uh, the Great Recession, uh, you were very thoughtful about uh, how to go through policy on making reductions. And so while this is not the time or place to start brainstorming those because we don't have enough information, I think it's important to know that you have a history of, of providing exceptional guidance during difficult times. And you did what every district was attempting to do. And that is to focus on the essential services. And the essential services are what happen in a classroom. Everything else you have to look at. And uh, that is not fun because there are a lot of really good things that support those essential services. But when it comes down to it, it's really about a classroom and a teacher working with our students. And uh, we will start looking as that is the context of what we're doing. Uh, and, uh, and then come back to the board with the context and the structure of what we learn about the cuts. We don't, we don't understand yet how the state is going to affect community funded districts. However, we know they are going to take some money from us. And uh, we're, you can expect that there'll be equity as far as the pain that'll be distributed across the state, that we will be equally as impacted as our uh, colleagues in uh, uh, LCFF districts. Um, but I think that what's important here is you have a lot of experience amongst the board, you have a lot of experience amongst the staff. We will bring to you the best information possible so that we can work together uh, on how you want to roll this out as far as policies and how we make reductions in the areas that we can make reductions. I also think it's important to know that this is going to be the first of many sessions we have to have. Uh, we will have many, many meetings uh, uh, because right now as we go through this, the board needs to really identify the priorities. Uh, we have a lot of great priorities uh, and you've given us latitude to, to manage those priorities. And even in the last month, we've had to make adjustments within our budget to meet those priorities. For example, we didn't think we would have to buy over a thousand hotspots for our kids to be connected. But yet we've, show, we've told you we've had to do that and that's something we had to do to maintain a level of instruction for all kids. Uh, and we still are facing a lot of those types of, of, of choices within the priorities that you have for us now. So um, I'd like to hand it off uh, next to Russell uh, to give you uh, uh, his, his perspective on how we go forward here. Uh, Russell has the advantage of having been in HR during the Great Recession and knows intimately how many districts across the county operated in making such cuts. Uh, but uh, I want to just remind you, today's not the decision to decide, tonight, today's not the time to decide what cuts to make. Uh, this is for us to learn about where we are and maybe start thinking about what kind of policies the board wants to put in place as we move forward. Russell? Thank you, um, So without getting into specifics, and this is uh, like Dr. Navarro has said, this isn't the time to do that because we're still waiting for um, uh, decisions, uh, numbers coming in the May revise. And uh, I, the one thing I wanna say to the board uh, and to the public is the fact that uh, we've been through crises before. And uh, with the support and guidance uh, of the board and with the skill of this particular staff, and I'm very, very, confident with this staff that we will make good decisions. 
uh, based on the values and principles of our district, and Dr. Navarro hit it right on the head, that it truly comes down to the, uh, what happens in the classroom, because that's what we're about. But there are so many essential things in this district, and so many things that we are very proud of in this district that make us special. Uh, and we're gonna have to look at everything. Uh, and, uh, but right now, this isn't the time to do that. Uh, but I do believe that we have the staff and we're going to have to make the time to be able to have these ongoing discussions to reach a good decision. Uh, the other thing, uh, you know, Jeff has given us some nice historical uh, information. Uh, many of us uh, have been in leadership roles through several of these crises. And, uh, and one way or another, we get through them. We balance the budget because we have to. Our, our community, our taxpayers, uh, you know, they make sure that we uh, are financially prudent and stewards of their funds. But these, they're gonna be some very difficult decisions to make. But we've navigated them before. Every uh, crisis is a little different. That's why Dr. Navarro talked about context and structure. So even though there are lessons learned and, and things that we've done in the past that we can look at, uh, we need to now look at what the context uh, is in this uh, crisis. So we will look at the past, but we're also gonna make sure that we look at what our current situation is and make the best decisions possible. So I, I know this is a very difficult message to convey, uh, but I think the, the one thing I want to say is that we're committed uh, to make sure our students are supported, make sure instruction continues to the best uh, level possible, uh, but like we've been saying throughout this whole crisis, things are going to be different, and this is not normal. And hopefully, we, we will hope for the best, uh, that uh, things will turn around, and whether it's the Nike swoosh or whether it's a, a, a U-shape, uh, you know, we hope that we'll be able to rebound from this quickly, uh, not only for our profession, but for all businesses uh, throughout the state and throughout the country. Martha, are there a couple questions? Yeah, we have, um, we have three hands up. Um, I did want to address one thing that Ashley asked, and, and, and I think that it's important for, um, for all of us to remember, and Jeff, you can probably chime in on it all as well, is in terms of some of the things that we did, Ashley, um, during the bankruptcy, as well as the embezzlement, is we had SB uh, 2X, which was able to sell property, excess property, and that's the result of Bear Street, uh, where Lifestyles is now, uh, we actually were able to, we got special um, ability um, in terms of the embezzlement and the bankruptcy to sell property um, that ordinarily when you sell property, excess property, it goes, it has to go into a special fund and we were able to use that to help balance the budget. Is that correct, Jeff? So, um, and we don't have a lot, the, the boards in, in years past have always been very cautious about selling property. Um, but Jeff, can you, uh, that's one of the, is that one of the options that um, we used at that time? Was that not correct? That's correct, and it was a very exceptional option. Yeah, that's what I thought. Okay, great. Um, I'm going to start with Ms. Snell because, Ms. Snell, you haven't had your hand up, um, so I'm going to put you on first. I wasn't um, prepared to start. <laughs> Um, I just want to say uh, I appreciate the uh, optimism of um, uh, the speakers, uh, but uh, this is really heartbreaking for all of us. Um, we've done so much uh, to address the whole child, um, putting so many programs in place for mental health and and um, and interventions, and it's. So it saddens me that some of these great programs could be cut. Um, I know we'll be looking at all kinds of options like projects, you know, that maybe we have to stop um, or um, uh, put off to another time. But um, I, I just, I have a lot of faith in, in the team and that you, you are going to uh, come up with um, some good suggestions with a lot of backup, with data, with um, what we need to do. And, um, but it is, it's, it's really, it's really sad to me 
to um, uh, some of the potential. So, um, and I would really like a copy of your presentation, Jeff. Um, that would be great if we could get an email copy when, uh, when you can. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Ms. Anderson. Um, yes, thank you. Um, I was wondering if we, because um, I know we have the May revised coming out. Um, I've been listening to a few other cities and districts and some people are making some immediate cuts. Do we have, have we been having any of those discussions as to here is one thing that we can cut immediately for the next 90 days that could be a certain amount of money or um, so that's my one question. And then my second question is, where are we with our reserves? And rather than going to the county treasurer or um, using other means, I, we have a pretty healthy reserve, is my understanding. So I haven't really heard that mentioned in this discussion today. Where are we on that? What, what are we thinking? Well, uh, I want to answer the first part, Ms. Anderson, if that's okay. Um, and I think it's wise uh, for us to better understand the structure of the cuts first before we can determine what could be the immediate, an immediate source of revenue that we can tap into by reductions. So uh, I think it's wise to wait to see which direction the, the state is going because the structure and the context of the cut will have a lot to do with, with how we can move forward. Well, I asked that specifically around like, so we got the bid list. So if there's bids that would be going out May 15th, are there any of those that we would put the pause on? So that, it's that, not necessarily that, things that are instructional costs or employees. It's things that we could put a stop before they go out. Uh, Jeff, would you like to address that um, in terms of construction and those funds? Well, um, there are certain funds like you have a 4% reserve that you have to use on maintenance and operations. That is uh, part of what was when, when you launched measure A was a commitment to the community. So you have that construction, uh, uh, that, that constraint, but then there's always con uh, contradictions during these times. And uh, for example, uh, you have the theater at Estancia, that is bond money. And that money can only be used for construction. So there are contradictions that have uh, that complicate how we explain where we're making cuts. And so that's why I'm uh, su 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 suggesting that we can't really come up with a list right away until we know the context and the structure of how these cuts are going to come. Uh, then we can reevaluate everything and determine where we can uh, tap into money for these. Um, well Respectfully, I disagree because if there's if there's potentially ten million dollars that is scheduled to be used June first, I think we should be having we should be thinking about possibly pausing that. So, you know, I think to have a discussion rather than waiting. Like I would like to hear from staff that we're going through all of the bids. We're making sure that things that don't have to be funded immediately can be paused because I would much rather see that than us ever have to lay off teachers or anything like that for the fall. We're gonna need more staff. We're gonna need more mental health resources. So I'm, I'm really concerned about us waiting to make some of these decisions when we could put the, a pause on them for now. Okay, again, I think you have to understand that there are some restrictions on certain funds. And while, I, we, I can't get in, while we can't get into that detail right now, when we learn what the entire picture is, we will come back to you with what some of our immediate issues can be to, to, to reduce a revenue and increase funding for other areas. Jeff, do you want to uh, follow the second half of that? Yes, thank you. Um, so to answer uh, Mrs. Anderson, Ms. Anderson's question regarding uh, reserves, the uh, charts that I showed you, that includes all of our reserves. It includes the, that's already assumed so even with all of our reserves, we still need 25 million to keep the uh, general fund um, whole. And so that just underscores the need for us to um, increase our reserves um, so we can uh, survive the cash dry period between July and December. Jim, anything else you wanna add? No, I think Dr. Navarro and Mr. Trader answered all of the issues. 
But that's why I want us to not wait, because if we can cut out money now, we need to be preparing for July in the fall. So I, I just, I, I would like to hear more in that from the staff in, in the next week, not yeah. waiting. Maybe, maybe um, uh, my, my effort to, to answer your question, Ms. Anderson, that Dr. Navarro was addressing, all of those projects that you see on the bid list are all funded from restricted accounts. They are not funded from the general fund. Well, I'm not talking about our bond money, which I think can be paused. I'm talking about we have tons of contracts. We have tons of items on our accounting register that are over 10,000. What, what can we pause immediately? What can we recalibrate? I don't want us to wait until July or August when we could be saving, we should be saving money now from things that we're not possibly even using. So. I, I just, I'm not, I'm not hearing that we're like the urgency and that it's concerning to me a little bit. Uh, Ashley, again, I think that you did that um, with all due respect, what, what uh, Tim just said is many of those construction projects are coming from restricted funds. Yeah. They are restricted to construction, i.e. we have a 4% of maintenance uh, fund that's where some of our ongoing maintenance is coming out of it it was passed with the bonds at both measure a was it was established with measure a and it's a covenant to the community that we were going to put four percent in and we don't have an option it would be in flagrant violation of the bond um and we i'm not talking about the bond money though i'm what, talking, what money part talking the about the ac money part of the Part of the AC money is general fund. If we are going to be having schools closed, can we postpone some of that? Like, I just want to hear that the staff are having, like, what are some immediate things that we could pause? Not just construction and not bond money across I, our budget. And I'm not I'd, hearing I'd like that. To, I'd like to respond to this. Uh, I think uh, when you take these, I, again, it goes to context and structure. There is uh, information coming out of the state that schools will be reopening at some point. So we don't know if we're gonna be in school closure at that point. So that would uh, have weigh a lot onto the condition of the learning environment for those schools who have yet to go undergo the completion of the AC project. We would want to present that to the board in its entirety so the board can make a policy decision about that. But without knowing how uh, the context is going to be one when, when we get to reopen how soon we get to reopen that's going to be part of what we have to analyze in this context so it's not there are and, and miss anderson is probably right there's probably something we can make a decision on in a week uh that to, to save some money but the big project like ac i think that's going to be a board policy decision so uh that's not for today we can't do that today because we don't have enough information. I don't want to do it today. I just want to hear that we're having the, where some of those have come up and are being considered because what I'm hearing from today, we're, that's not in place yet. And so I would like to hear, I know that there are a lot of contracts we can reconsider there. It's not, it's not just one area. So I, what I'm asking is to hear from staff, what are some clear areas that don't necessarily tap into our reserves that don't necessarily respond to bond money. What are some things that we can cut? <laughs> like, so Ms. Anderson, I think it's hard to answer. You can't, we can't give you that answer right now. What if the state says we're going to take all your special ed money too? But we have to be preparing. So right, if right. But, but, and I don't want to get, uh, but the point is, I don't think we have enough information right now to go in and make that, Judicious. We're not, but we don't have, so what I would love to say, so this is where I'm kind of going, I would love for us to have some contingency plans and have the staff share that with the board and the public. So here is A, B, and C plan if special ed gets cut. Here, just even just some ideas. Here is A, B, and C plan if it looks like 10 million will be cut. I'm, we're not hearing those, any of those ideas. I would love to hear some of those. And I, ex and I explained in our preface, today is not the day for that, and we will get to that point. I believe that's what he said, that that's what staff is planning on doing. Well, but one of the reasons I asked for us to have this meeting were what are the current district budget priorities for short term? Like, that was what we talked about at the end of our last board meeting. So 
well, today is not the day to unpack the whole budget. What the board, it was my understanding, we were asking on the 28th, what are the district's top budget priorities, knowing we're going to have to make cuts? And I provided those to you in a memo last night. They're in the district priorities and they're in the uh, LCAP priorities. No, you, you brought up the district priorities and what our LCAP priorities are. What are, let, what are three things that we are really concerned about? Not our overall priorities, not our overall LCAP priorities. What are, our, what are some things we're worried about losing? What do we wanna make sure that we have enough funding for that we need to be focused on for the next three months? May I interject? Yes, please. Uh, Ms. Uh, Matoye. Thank you. Um, what I'm here, well, my points originally were, please send us the PowerPoint. Thank you, Mrs. Snell, you said that. Um, I, I think Ms. Anderson is aware of the fact that in a district or any large government organization, there are buckets of money with designated funds that have to go someplace, not just the bond money, but other monies that have to go somewhere. What I'm hearing is not, Ms. Ant, Ms. Ant, and correct me if I'm wrong, Mrs. Ant, Ms. Anderson, she isn't asking, what are we doing? She's asking, we want to hear that you're talking about it for this meeting. We want you here th so that it's, the public gets to hear too, that the people that are talking, that are in the room talking about it are going, oh my gosh, we need to have plan A, B, C, D, and E in case we have V, U, W, or swoosh. So that's what we're hearing now, because of course we can't. I, I, Mark, Mrs. Floor and I explained to our, our Congress people and our uh, legislators, it's nothing more frustrating than working your little tails off trying to get a plan in place and then hearing something from the government that totally stops what we're doing and changes direction. We just, you guys just wasted so much time and, frust and are frustrated because it's like, oh my gosh. So yes. that's what we ask for. So what, and it, it wouldn't take you but a couple sentences to just let us know. The people in the room are talking about these things and after the May revise comes out, we'll be able to let you know what plan A, B, C, and D are or what contingencies we're talking about. I think that, that would put, put us all at ease knowing. Now, Mrs. Black, Mrs. Floor, Mrs. Yelsey, they've gone through some major crises. They know you guys are doing that. But I think that's what she would like to hear and, and well, people in the public. And it's not a tough thing to say because I know that's what you guys are doing. Well, I guess the question is, Ms. Uh, Jeff, would you put up your PowerPoint where you said that what you were going to be coming back to us on the 29th with, was? Because I believe it was on your PowerPoint, Jeff. There you go, uh, next steps. See, look at the last bullet, discussion of recommended solutions and scenarios. I believe, and we have confidence in our staff, that they are already working on multiple scenarios and multiple, uh, I mean, do we want, would you like to hear from each one of the staff members? Yes, this is keeping us up at night. We are looking at scenarios. We are looking at um, priorities. Uh, we all, you know, our, our simple priority has been in this, and I think all of us on the board can attest that we all believe that the same thing we've done every single time, keep the cuts as far away from the classroom as possible. I think Dr. Navarro has said it multiple times in this presentation. Is well, that I'm just happy to see, I mean, honestly, we're seeing oh. Jeff's presentation for the first time. So part of my concern is addressed even by seeing here are the next steps, we're having a discussion of solutions. So, even that is helpful. This is the first time we're seeing that today, right now. So Absolutely. that's where I'm, I'm saying like, we, that's, I just wanna make sure we're hitting it and we're at least talking about it today in some form. And I believe that, um, I think that as long as we pay attention to the, the screen and we can, you know, we can infer what we want to infer, but it's there in black and white. Um, and if we have staff uh, say it multiple times, um, I trust that staff is, is doing that. Um, this is keeping them up at night. I will tell you that Char and I, um, last yesterday, uh, Greg Franklin was on the, the, the uh, conference call with John Morlock. And I tell you, he hit us with something that 
we didn't even think we didn't even figure and that was he talked about rolling school closures that we're all talking about the fact that school's going to hopefully open but he said we are, are starting to address the issue of what happens if we have a student or a staff member at a school who is becomes infected and we don't have to close the entire district but we will have to face a rolling school closure where a school may have to be closed and quarantined for 15 to 28 days who who would have thought that and i know that i sent that to russell and russell says yes it's keeping us up at night um yep. I mean, these are these are issues that that we won't have any answers to, and how we how we address that. The the fact that uh, the governor says we're going to open up, and then we may have to go to split session. Well, that's that's terrific, but that impacts our staff, and that's in transportation. And oh yeah, just go ahead and put dividers up in classrooms and do social distancing. These are all things that the staff, and that's why you know it is all up in the air because. As Shar said, the the governor and 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 actually John Morlock said the same thing that no one's speaking to an, uh, each other. That they're not letting uh, the governor comes out with these things and lets Democrats and Republicans know five minutes before his speech what he may say. He's not even talking to uh, Tony Thurman, uh, the CDE, you know, superintendent of schools this is ridiculous and we've all impressed upon him the plan and i believe that our staff is again trying to come up with a plan um with the understanding that this board is committed to providing excellent uh, education to our kids and keeping those those, those um, mrs floor if i can if i can add something sure. to this discussion um so uh, i i do want to assure the board that the, actually, I'm, I'm going to go back. Uh, we've already been in a mode since this crisis hit to only spend what's been essential. And I've had to have conversations with principals about that. And you know, the the, the philosophy is we're going to we're going to get what we need and buy what we need and make sure we fund what we need. But this is not the time to be buying things and. And as you know, you know, conferences and all the normal stuff that we would normally be spending, we have not uh, moved forward with. So for a lot of reasons, but part of it is just being very financially prudent at this time. And so in terms of immediate uh, uh, reductions that we can make, uh, we've had preliminary conversations on that. And wherever, whatever we can put a hold on, we're actually already been doing it for the last couple of months. Uh, but, you know, I don't want to add to what's already been said, but I just want you to know that we've already been very conservative, very careful with our spending, not only today, but over the last couple of months. And, and of course, if we can make some further reductions between now and the end of the year, certainly we will do that. This is not the time to announce that. We have not gone through our process. We, uh, so we, we wanna be very uh, deliberate about that, okay? But, but I do wanna assure the board, we are absolutely having those conversations and we've already been in a very conservative uh, mode uh, since this crisis hit. Great, thank you. I have two more uh, lights, uh, Ms. Black. Yeah, thank you. Um, part, of, part of the um, budget process um, we are currently in this school year, so we're under contract already. The board's already pretty much approved everything. So as we move forward, it will give us, you know, the opportunity to look at all the different programs and different um, contracts, um, both individuals that we hire, different services. Um, and so I'm more concerned <laughs> Uh, about, and I think I shared with Dr. Navarro and, and Martha and also Jeff, is I would like to look at some alternatives to financing out there regarding um, bonds and whatnot, because I'm more concerned about our technology and by being at the end stages and trying to catch up um, is gonna be more cost, um, you know, more costly than if we start planning now ahead of it. So um, 
so I hear what <laughs> Ashley is saying, um, but this is our time when we can go through our contracts that we've already approved and we are committed to paying. And in the future, we can look at each and every one of those down the road, you know, at all different, you know, and I know you're going to have all the different departments doing that because that's what, it, whether, whether we're in a crisis mode or not, that's been how we've built our budgets. And uh, as they bring back recommendations back, you know, to staff on what they absolutely have to have and, and whatnot. So it is really a good um, project, I think, during this time to look at it. But to start, you know, um, labeling things and talking about what you cut just sends out a lot of concern with employees and whether they'll have a job and, and they'll be, you know, so I, I understand. But I also understand Ashley because that's where I go too. I want to know. <laughs> so. I think we should cut a lot of other things, not staff. That's why I'm like, I want us to be planning now so we don't ever have to do that. But programs, Ashley, programs involve staff. There's very few things <clears throat> that we do that doesn't involve a staff. So when you start talking anything about cuts or anything about anything related to um, lowering your budget, people get concerned. And that's just, you know, um, and we're going to be hearing it. They're going to be hearing it on the news. They're going to be hearing it everywhere. We need to make sure that we, um, and I know you, agree with this because I know that your community needs to be reassured as well, just like mine does. But I, but I believe that um, doing any kind of knee jerk at this point and making recommendations would cause more, um, you know, panic, quite frankly. And I think we need to have our steady pace of governance and make sure that we keep the community and our staff, you know, aware of it. So I understand, but it's not normal times. This is crazy. So it's not normal. Not Thank normal. Uh, Ms. Bartow. Yes, a uh, couple things. I um, had a lot of conversations with people in the public recently, and I just want to underscore how things change day to day. So um, just for transparency, we get an email. It comes from our senators. It comes from our representatives with information. And the next night we get an email, and that email has completely different information than the day before. Mm -hmm. So it's a really a day-to-day -day change that we are, are working with and on. Um, another thing I, I think is a great thing that we do for the majority of our contracts, and I'd like to see it done with all if possible. I know that that's not always possible, but maybe now people will be more flexible, is how we have a not to exceed in our, in our contract. I think that's important to understand. For example, with office supplies, we have a not to exceed a certain amount. Um, that doesn't mean we have to spend that amount. It just means that that is the amount that we're contracted up to. So maybe if we don't, we don't, we're not in the office, we don't need office supplies as, as frequently. I think it's an important thing too. Um, and then just kind of understanding that there's gonna be a lot of changes. There's gonna be possibly rolling starts. We might have to allocate more of our budget to uh, sanitization. We might have to, to plexiglass in the classrooms to hand washing stations at every door. Something, something mm -hmm. like that is something we can't foresee. And then finally, we're really gonna be dependent on what our uh, property tax payment comes in on the 21st. That's going to be a huge deciding factor. So I'm glad to hear that everyone is kind of keeping uh, frugality in mind. Um, and I'm glad that we have a lot of contracts that allow us flexibility. Um, and we'd just like to encourage wherever possible that we keep those contracts with vendors that give us the not to exceed instead of the, you know, this is the set amount. Okay. Great. Thank you. Uh, let me let me make, let me scroll down here. Um, Ms. Yelsey, you haven't um, said anything. Do you have any comments or uh, questions or anything like that? I want to make sure that um, all the board members have the opportunity. Um, thank you. I don't have any questions right now, but I just appreciate everybody's look into what we're what we're doing now. And I know I, I just from knowing the people involved because we've been through this, they are looking. At what we're going to need to do and as you know as Jeff said in his report there I'm, I'm sure he's looking at it every day 24 7 probably and I just appreciate what's going on because and we can hear in these conversations you know someone says we can't cut mental health we can't cut technology I mean we can all go through and say what we don't want to cut and somehow I really have confidence and maybe it's being really optimistic that I, yeah, we're gonna have to make some cuts, but I think it's going to make less impact 
on student learning than we may think at this point. I'm really hoping that's the case because I think we are really creative, our district, in coming up with solutions for these kinds of things. And I think, as everybody says, the most important thing is to keep it away from the classrooms. And, and that's what we have to look at. What can we do to keep it away from the classroom? Great, thank you. I think the other thing that we have to remember is, um, and I know that Jeff, um, you're doing this because you're gonna be providing multi-year scenarios, is that it took a long time to recover uh, from all of these. Um, we have teachers' aides now instead of instructional aides um, in the classroom. When we used to have instructional aides back in the day, before the bankruptcy and before the embezzlement, we had instructional aides. They were called, and they were allowed to be in the classroom without a teacher. Um, that was the definition of an instructional aid. Um, and not only in special ed, but throughout our district, we had instructional aids. Um, when the bankruptcy hit, uh, that was one area that we changed the focus and went to teacher aides um, instead of instructional aids um, because of being able, the ability that we'd have to, we needed support, but um, they had to be in a classroom because that we, we, we increased class size, to be real honest. Um, so there are, there are lots of, there's a lots of opportunities and they're looking at all scenarios and all things. Um, Dr. Navarro, what would you like the board um, as a next step, do you want the board to submit to you and um, their, their top three priorities um, and being as specific as possible? Um, what would you like from us at this point in time in preparation for um, the next meeting on the 29th? Or do you believe that we should be having a, uh, an interim meeting with just the board as relates to working on priorities, because it is now um, 11:20. We're supposed we're um, scheduled to go in uh, to close session at 11:11:30. Uh, um, so, what would what would you like the board to do for next steps to help? Well, uh, I think our next step is uh, to work with the board president on identifying additional sessions where we could meet with you. Uh, once we get some more solid information from the state, because at that point, the more information we have and we have an indication of what the policy uh, changes are going to be at the state level, then we will have a better idea of how to present that information to you and then start getting your feedback on what the priorities are going to be. Uh, so I think uh, what I'd like to do is have the boards understand that I'll be working with the board president to schedule additional meetings and that as much as possible uh, for the board to be as nimble and available as possible in the event that we get additional information that comes out of uh, surprise uh, legislation that might pop up somewhere. Uh, but I think uh, it's I think uh, it's very, very uh, challenging right now, as Michelle mentioned. I'm glad you're talking or reading Mr. Blattner's information. It's, it's very good information. But I think uh, Ms. Matoy asked a really good question the other day about our neighboring districts that uh, want to go basic aid. Are they going to be able to go? Nobody knows. Nobody knows where they're going to be. Nobody knows what the per pupil expenditure from the state is going to be. They may go basic aid just because they lower the, the LCFF allocation and they may already be above that. So nobody knows. So I think uh, uh, we'd love to, if, if, if possible, have the board, board's encouragement to meet more regularly in the next, in the next few weeks. Great. Okay, so we'll, um, Dr. Navarro, I'll work with you about scheduling um, a, uh, an, an additional study session. Um, I know, Ms. Anderson, you are um, working feverishly. Um, Dana and Michelle, you also have, you, you are fully engaged and un, not retired. Um, are evening meetings better for you? I mean, I mean, I'm trying to be sense. Want to be sensitive to to the what three time of day? in in terms of the time of day, um, in terms of for you all. So if you could just uh, send me a, a, your ideal schedule of times of, of times of days. We also have to be sensitive to staff because they're working. But I just want to I want to be really sensitive to you all because I know that you know taking up a whole day or half a day or whatever. Um, impacts impacts you so and your your ability to to do your jobs 
So please send me that information. Uh, if you could just send me a text or an email, um, CC Dr. Navarro so that we have that information and to Sherry so that uh, we'll be sending out um, a, um, you know, a sort of a, what, what let's see, I know we- Questionnaire. We, well, it's not a questionnaire. even a questionnaire. It's, it's kind of, the, you know, it's like we, I do it all the time with another group that they, they send out a, a little thing and they say, tell me your dates. and they put on the date. So um, we'll try and do that, but just, so just let us know if you would, please. Um, anything else, final words? Uh, Jeff, do you have any final words? Oh, I don't see your hands. Oh, there your hands are up now. Okay. Uh, <laughs> Mine's Ms. really quick. Ms. Matoya, can we have, can we, when we close out of this and go into closed session, can we have a five minute break in between? Sign in and then take a five minute break? Yes, yes. Thank you. We can sign in. We can close this out early, um, and then we can go into a closed session. And then Ms. Barto. Uh, mine is a, a free way that we are do, doing well for our students that I wanted to share. So studies have shown that um, female students, especially from disadvantaged backgrounds, uh, don't do as well in classrooms because they're afraid of speaking up. And I was on a webinar about learning theory, and it's great to see it in my own student classroom. So I think that there's one good thing that we're really doing for our students through this that's unexpected, is I am seeing a lot more participation from girls who are good students, but in a normal classroom wouldn't thrive because they're not raising their hand, they're afraid of being judged, they're not volunteering, and watching the successes both through in my son's classroom and in other classrooms I've heard of, and hearing stories of friends who are talking about their daughters who up to now had really struggled with school and are loving the ability to communicate with their teachers and learn and really engage because they don't have that stigma of oh I don't I don't want to be weird and raise my hand I think it's something that's really important to highlight because um, because there's not a lot of great news right now and I think that highlighting any that we can is, is um, valuable well and I'll tell you we heard the same thing um, in the mental health task force which was by the way fabulous um, Angela did a wonderful job, but Bill talked about students that have a fear of school um, and that we'd have these, these, these kids that were always con traditionally sarbing because they're not going to school or not participating. And these kids who are normally don't want to be in school, have a fear of school, are now fully engaged and are participating in the classroom. And it's just going to show that we are reaching kids in some instances that are no, not necessarily been, been reached before. Um, and that this is offering us an opportunity to really think about how we deliver prog you know, program and, and school to kids that just don't fit the general mold. And I'm glad to hear about um, the, the, the female students, our, our, our young ladies, because I think that's it's so true. I also find it fascinating in the conversations with the kids yesterday is that they just want to be together. And you know, before we talked about this, it was always about trying to get kids off tech, uh, off cell phones, Instagram, FOMO, all of that. And yet now they're putting down their phones and they're wanting to be face to face with people, which is a, another, um, another positive thing that's going on. So with that, um, I have to let me go back on here because I have to get my cheat sheet here for Sherry. Okay, so um, we are going to um, recess into closed session. Uh, we will be starting the closed session at, I'll give you until 11.35. Uh, uh, so, um, we have two items. We have a conference with legal counsel, anticipated litigation, significant exposure to litigation pursuant to paragraph two of subdivision D of government code section 54956.9, one case, uh, letter from private attorney regarding threatened litigation over security fencing and drop off uh, parking lot project at Ensign Intermediate School and number uh, 7B, conference with legal uh, uh, counsel, anticipated litigation, deciding whether to initiate litigation pursuant to paragraph four of section D of government code, section 
nine. And uh, Dr. Navarro, will there be a report out? I don't believe so. Okay. So we will, uh, may I have, uh, we don't need a motion, so we will be um, recessing into closed session um, at 11.35. Thank you all for participating and we will get better and we'll talk soon. Thank you. Uh, it was moved by Mrs. Matoyer and seconded by Mrs. Black to adjourn the meeting at 1.26 p.m. on 5-8-2020. There was no reportable actions taken um, in closed session.